Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my research. It's very much research uh, in progress, so I, I would be very happy to receive a lot of comments and critical suggestions from you, especially from uh, any South Africans in the room, and there might be some, some here. Um, well, actually, I think my story kind of complements that of Haroon, um, because um, Unlike Harun, I will focus on, on, on a much shorter period, but I will look at the post-crisis, so post-2008 situation of South African labor markets. And also I will look at uh, more, well, take more of a dynamic perspective, so I will look at individual transitions in and out of uh, employment and unemployment. So the outline of my presentation is the following. Uh, I will first introduce uh, the motivation of the study and the research question. Uh, I will then go into describing the two longitudinal data sets I used to analyze uh, or at least attempt to analyze this research question. Uh, I will use the data to construct transition matrices uh, and also uh, decomposable uh, mobility measures, so labor market mobility measures. Uh, I will say something about uh, my empirical model. Uh, and discuss the results and then I will uh, just close with uh, a number of well, summarizing my, my main findings and also uh, looking at some avenues for further research. Uh, so, uh, as Harun al has already said, uh, South Africa was uh, heavily affected by, by the global crisis because it was uh, well integrated into the crisis. And so many uh, studies have, have documented that uh, due to the impact of external uh, shocks, real sector shocks in private capital flows, trade, and, and for some countries also uh, remittances, um, that uh, growth got affected in developing and uh, emerging market economies. So this also counts for South Africa. Uh, as Harun said, uh, South Africa entered recession for the first time uh, since the fall of apartheid in uh, 2008, so the fourth quarter of 2008, uh, and knew then uh, three um, negative quarters of growth. So, and since uh, the recovery has been very anemic uh, and punctuated actually by renewed uh, global economic slowdown. So my figure is, well, less fancy than that of Haroon, but basically showing them the same thing that there was, uh, was a recession in growth and that the recovery has been, has been quite an anemic uh, ever since. Of course, uh, this uh, adverse macroeconomic trajectory has not been without consequences for South African households or South African uh, individuals. Um, the official figures indicate a net employment loss of about one million uh, individuals over the, the, the most intense phase of the crisis and then a, a slow recovery uh, after that. And we also see a rise in unemployment rates over 2008-2012. Uh, um, as we all know, labor market status is a critical determinant of household and individual well-being, and, and this is definitely no different uh, for South Africa. Um, also, as Arun has explained, there's the, there was already high and, and very structural unemployment and segmented labor markets before the crisis. Uh, so most of the unemployment is structural uh, due to some of the factors highlighted before, like skill-biased uh, technology change. Um, and so th this unemployment has, has been described as South Africa's Achilles heel. So, so uh, it's, a, it's a logical question to ask how far can it be, uh, I mean, how far can, can South Africa go in, in, in rising unemployment rates before something uh, really drastic uh, happens. Um, also from the literature we know that economic recessions tend to have heterogeneous impacts on different kinds of workers. Um, and so in my study, I tried to complement earlier uh, crisis impact studies by uh, using longitudinal data sets instead of uh, repeated cross-sections. So my research question is, is fairly simple. Uh, which individual, household level, and job-specific variables are associated with staying employed or not in South Africa during the height of the crisis and in its aftermath? So just, this is just to illustrate uh, the importance of uh, unemployment um, or of the unemployment rate in South Africa. We see that uh, during the crisis, the narrow unemployment uh, rose slightly, but, but there was a much greater increase in broad unemployment. And if we focus on broad unemployment, we see 
uh, a number of uh, heterogeneous, I mean, there are a number of group differences. So, for example, in the, in the second graph, I compare uh, male with females, and, and you see that whilst females have uh, higher uh, broad unemployment, the gap, um, well, diminished during the crisis. So, so males were apparently uh, hit harder during, uh, during the crisis. Of course, uh, this kind of cross-sectional data only provide a very netted out picture of changes in uh, South African labor markets, and, and so to evaluate uh, gross changes, we need uh, longitudinal uh, data sets to identify which are exactly the people that move in and out of uh, employment. And that is what I set out to do with two data sets. Uh, first, uh, the NITS, the National Income Dynamics Study, which is uh, South Africa's first nationally representative multi-purpose individual level panel data survey. Uh, it has had two waves so far. Well, there's, there's a third wave has become available just days ago, so I hadn't had the chance to look at it. Um, I analyze, uh, uh, or my analysis is restricted to adults uh, age 20 to 55, uh, because I don't want my transitions to be influenced by school leavers or, or pensioners. Uh, and uh, there are six mutually exclusive labor market statuses, uh, so there's regular wage employment, self-employment, uh, there's uh, casual and other employment, uh, that other employment also includes uh, subsistence agriculture. Uh, and then the searching unemployed, uh, the discouraged unemployed, that are those people that are willing to work but not actively looking uh, for work, I mean not actively searching for a job. Um, and then you have the not economically active, uh, those are the people outside uh, the labor force. Uh, I must say before I show the results, of course, that there are a number of problems with NITS. Um, as indicated by the people that constructed the data set themselves. So there's some misclassification between the different categories of the non-employed in wave two. So I will also let this inform my empirical model. Uh, and also the between waves attrition rates are overall uh, quite acceptable, but uh, they're much higher for better off whites. And, and these better off whites are exactly also the people that were less likely to participate in wave one, so, so this gives extreme weights and can make the estimates for, for this particular group uh, less, less reliable. Uh, then the QLFS, QLFS is, is actually the official data source for unemployment uh, rates of South Africa um, and has been there since 2000, the first quarter of 2008. Uh, this is not a, a panel of individuals, but it's actually a, a rotating panel, panel of dwellings. Uh, and so the unit of analysis is the household. Uh, and normally the household identifiers are uh, maintained over uh, the different quarters, but not necessarily the individual identifiers. And so um, I use a matching technique developed by Ranchot and Dinkelman um, to match individuals from one quarter to the next quarter uh, using household ID, age, gender, race, uh, education, uh, and marital status. Uh, and I achieve uh, an average matching of 68 uh, or almost 69 percent. Uh, I use inverse probability weighting techniques to, to correct for non-random uh, matching on, on observables. Um, and so I use probits to estimate the probability of being matched to the next wave. Uh, and so I reweight uh, my sample to, to, to kind of uh, tease this out. Uh, I also restrict my analysis to, to the same age group as, as, I, as I do for NITS. Um, and then here, um, the labor market statuses are not 100% comparable. So uh, in the QLFS, I use formal sector employment, informal sector em employment, and then the three other categories are, are, are quite similar than, than those in NITS. Uh, also, this uh, match data set has a number of problems. Uh, it's possible that, of course, there's non-random matching on unobservables, uh, for which I cannot control. For example, uh, households that migrated from one dwelling to another, they cannot be matched. And so if you assume that uh, households that migrate or individuals that, that migrate are more likely to change their status, then we're actually underestimating mobility uh, in this sample. Also, there's a possibility of false matches. I, I, uh, I try to, to minimize this by, by checking uh, consistent or doing consistency checks on educational status and marital status. 
but of course it's still possible that there are some false matches which would of course overestimate um, the labor market mobility. So what does this give? Um, looking at the data, um, I have here a transition matrix. Uh, you see that, uh, in fact, there's quite some mobility in, in, in uh, South African labor markets. You see that almost 24% of those people in regular wage employment in 2008 were no longer in regular wage employment uh, by 2010-11. But there's also uh, mobility in, in, the other, in the other direction, so lots of people that were unemployed, uh, searching or, or discouraged, they actually found a job in 2010-11. Um, so we can use this, this, uh, this uh, survey-weighted um, transition matrix also to construct uh, measures of uh, mobility. So if you look at overall mobility, I find that actually uh, just over half of all the individuals in my sample um, moved from one uh, labor market state to another. And if I decompose that in upward mobility, meaning people transitioning from, um, from uh, non-employment to uh, employment, and uh, downward mobility, so people moving from employment to uh, non-employment, or within mobility, uh, I get the following figures. Um, so you see that here, uh, downward mobility was a, a bit higher than, than, than upward mobility. But uh, the largest component was actually within non-employment mobility. But since, since there has been some misclassification, uh, we, need, we need to take this with a, with a grain of salt. Um, so doing the same thing for QLFS, I'm not sure whether you uh, can, 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 see the, can see the data from here. Um, but um, the main point is, yeah, of course, mobility is, is much lower in this, in this um, transition matrix because um, the QLFS is a quarter-to-quarter -quarter, uh, data set. So, of course, quarterly mobility is much lower than uh, mobility over a span of two years. Um, and you also see that, that the states are far uh, from, from stable. Um, and especially... Uh, there's a lot of uh, ch uh, a lot of changing in statuses uh, among the the unemployed. Um, if you look at it um, uh, in an intertemporal, I mean, comparing years, uh, you see that actually all states have become more absorbing. So this means that labor market mobility has actually decreased uh, during the crisis. Um, so both uh, upward mobility as as downward uh, mobility. And as has already been noted in other studies, actually the, the rise in unemployment rates during the crisis is more due to, to reduced inflows into employment than actually outflows out of employment. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, in this paper, I focus on downward mobility. So here I, I can uh, calculate it, uh, the decomposable mobility measures. So my empirical model um, is actually a very simple survey-weighted binary product probit model, uh, so I estimate uh, two kinds of probits, one for NITS, one for QLFS, um, and so my outcome variable equals one if an individual in regular wage employment in 2008 was again uh, in regular wage employment by 2010-11, and zero if, it w if that individual was uh, initially in regular wage employment, but no longer so in 2010. So I leave out actually those people that did not have a job um, when the crisis hit. So meaning here, looking at the NITs, I focus on the individuals in gray, so uh, on the first row only. Uh, so of course this can be used to, 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 this technique can be used to also look at the other transitions, but just to, um, just to focus here on, on, the, on the downward mobility, I, I take only those individuals. So the QLFS, very similar, but here we look at formal sector employment, um, and transitions from one quarter to uh, the next. And I pull quarter to quarter transitions over the years to see whether there has been any evolution in factors that influence this downward mobility. Um, so my explanatory variables are um, both individual and household level demographic and locational variables. These are the standard variables also used in cross-sectional uh, studies. And then I add a number of job-specific variables, occupation types, uh, industry types, union membership, 
uh, and contract types and durations. And I do all estimations separate for men and women because they have been shown, uh, has been shown that there's uh, a lot of different dynamic dynamics going on uh, for men and women. And this also follows, uh, follows the literature. So um, looking at my estimates, um, I see, so these are the estimates using NITS. Uh, I, I, I just printed here the average marginal effects. Um, you see that actually um, those people of, of in the middle age group um, have a higher chance of keeping their job, I mean, remaining in, in a regular wage employment uh, over this two year period. And you see that there are some buffering effects of uh, education or of secondary or higher education, uh, but only significantly so for uh, women. So remember that I focus on, on those people that were already in regular wage employment in 2008, so those are already the people that have typically have higher, uh, higher education. But so for men, uh, this education did not provide an extra buffering effect during the crisis, or at least that's what, what I find using needs. Um, and on, you see also that the racial effects are non-significant. Uh, again, of course, um, the, these racial effects are highly significant if you just look at uh, cross-sectional data, if you just look at um, who has a job in the first place, this is really very much determined by, by racial effects, but we see no racial compounding effects during, during the crisis. Um, this can also be due, of course, due to the unrepresentative of, of the better off whites in, in the sample, so that's, that's an open question. Um, then adding some, um, some extra job-specific variables, you see that uh, semi-skilled and managerial or professional jobs um, provide higher job security for females, uh, but not for males. Uh, looking at the industry dummies, uh, you see that uh, especially construction and wholesale and retail trade uh, were sectors where there was less uh, job security during the crisis. So this. Uh, is also found in the, in the cross-sectional uh, studies. Uh, the only thing that, that struck me is that there is no significant uh, coefficient on manufacturing, which was actually the sector that suffered most uh, in cross-sectional terms of unemployment. But if we look at, at the repeated cross-sections, we also see that there has been quite a, a fast rebound in uh, manufacturing uh, employment. So it might be that those people have more transferable skills uh, and over a two-year period, uh, we do not catch these, uh, catch these temporary uh, unemployment effects from manufacturing. Um, looking at um, union membership, we see that uh, union members are definitely um, have a higher chance of keeping their job. Also, uh, written contracts and permanent contracts uh, lead to uh, higher job security. So um, that's kind of logic. Um, then looking at the QLFS, this, this enables us to, to compare these effects over time. Now I see, now I, I find actually that, that um, it's basically the younger uh, uh, employees that, that lose out during the crisis, and this is consistent over, over the number of over all the years. Um, and especially, it's especially uh, sorry, it's especially high for for uh, female workers. Um, looking at the uh, education effects, we do find uh, now a buffering effect of higher education uh, for men um, and also for women, but we see that it has declined, uh, has generally declined uh, over time. I, I do not have really a, a good explanation for that, so if somebody would have a suggestion that would be very helpful. Uh, and we also see some uh, racial effects, uh, especially for uh, white males, so this is uh, in contrast to the, to the NITS findings. Uh, then I, I just added one more uh, estimation with um, the, the uh, industry effects, and we see again that construction and uh, retail trade are those sectors that uh, provide less job security. Um, and also here, uh, transport is uh, is is uh, okay. I, I will move to uh, to my conclusions. So um, there was my main findings are that. First of all, there's considerable mobility in South African labor markets if you look at it at, uh, from an individual dynamic perspective. Uh, and this, this uh, corresponds well with, with the findings of other periods. Um, I see that NITS and QLFS uh, both suggest that likelihood of continued employment differs significantly between different groups of workers. 
So lower for younger workers, workers with less than secondary education, and males employed in construction and trade. Uh, and uh, chances were higher for trade union members and those with written or permanent contracts. Looking at the evolutions, uh, we do find that there is some time variation in the economic si significance of some of the variables, but it's very difficult to actually connect them empirically or theoretically to uh, the broader evolution of the South African economy. And so these are some avenues for further research, which uh, I'll, I'll just leave the slide on so you, so you can read it. Thank you very much.